Welcome to the King's Beat Podcast. I am James Hamm, King's Insider for ESPN 1320 and the King's Beat. Joining me, Fox 40's Sean Cunningham. Sean, how are you? I'm good. I'm actually in the Fox 40 closet that we like to call our posh sports suite that needs to be decorated very badly. That like Republic thing right there is just not put correctly. We're like We have too much white wall. We need to fix this. But other than that, I'm fine. How are you guys? Nobody put Sean in the closet. No, don't do it. Uh, of course, we have uh, Brendan Nunez from the King's Pulse podcast. Jesus. Brendan, how are you? Wow. I'm doing good. Can't help but feel good after after that intro. I really feel like I'm I'm somebody. You're not living <laughs> up to it, pal. You really yeah. need to bring the energy. <laughs> I, I got I to gotta match it a little better. <laughs> yeah, fair uh, enough. These are my Fed-rated voices from when I was a kid. Was it Shadow Stevens? Is that who did the Fed-rated stuff? He also yeah. did a uh, late late show with Craig Ferguson. I used to really enjoy that show. Now it's okay. uh James Corden. He's doing a fine job, but I was really a big Craig Ferguson guy. All right. All right. I know um, you didn't ask, but it's <laughs> uh, you're a late night guy. I mean, you're a huge SNL fan and oh, yeah. you know, like we can make references all the time that Brendan won't understand. Uh we were before this I was doing Tombstone references and uh I stumped both of these guys, but Sean, of course, knew who it was eventually. I love that movie, and I was so surprised. I knew it was Billy Bob Thornton. I got that part right, but I kind of thought it was Bad Santa. No. Yeah. So I, I kept saying, it's like playing cards with my brother's effing kids. But that's not what I said. So um, I had the F word in there. But we're hoping that the Wilcox family and Wes, Wes's kids are listening this week to the uh, the King's Beat podcast. Um, okay, so we've had a busy week. Um, I don't know about you guys, but like we get so amped up and ready and like can't wait for more content. And then it's like content overload and we need a day off, um, which we're not going to get. <laughs> That's not happening anytime Sorry. soon. Sorry. Uh, we had a, a scheduled potential scheduled day off for tomorrow, but Sean blew that. Uh, so we will be back in practice on Saturday. And by the uh, way, you're welcome because otherwise otherwise you wouldn't be talking to Deer and Fox because we'll be talking fault. tomorrow. So, yeah. Well, everyone else gets to talk to Deer and Fox. So, uh, I mean. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's why I was looking out for you. <laughs> yeah, I can't wait for the Cowbell Kingdom exclusive oh, uh, Deer and Fox interview or, uh, you know, I don't know. Clutch Sports will get the, their Deer and Fox one-on-one here any day now so it's one of those deals um okay so let's just take care of some business uh number one if you're watching on youtube give us a thumbs up and subscribe if you would like to uh be a sponsor of the podcast there is a link in the youtube uh channel here that uh you can fill out a form and the great john santiago uh my old partner in cowbell kingdom will uh will get back to you um and so that's cool uh also thank you to all the new uh premium subscribers we've had a ton of premium subscribers i warned everybody we were going to gate content we gated content you guys have responded uh so welcome all new uh premium subscribers to the king's beat um and then also we're still working on uh, i want to hopefully somehow figure it out for this coming week um but an off the record with the king's beat virtual happy hour um we're working on a guest it's one of those deals we may not we may have to go without a guest just because it's chaos time um but uh okay let's get to it um last week i think we started with tuesday over reactions uh we don't have to do that because it's friday um but uh we've had a lot of craziness going on and normally i don't start the show with uh something that happened with the golden state warriors um but i i think it warrants uh, like a, an early business of basketball conversation. Um, hey guys, what are your thoughts on the the Draymond Green uh, like hammering uh, Jordan Poole in in Warriors practice? And what do you think the outcome is going to be here? Because it kind of seems like the Warriors were hoping they would sneak away without anything going on, and then someone released the tape. They put the tape out. They're always watching. So, what do you guys got? Um, I guess I'll go first. I was I was gonna let Brendan go first, uh, which I probably should, but I, I feel it. I have some pretty strong feelings on it, and I've seen a lot of strong feelings throughout the internet. But maybe it's because, and I I work in a medium where you know, video content is everywhere. That's I mean, it's what we rely on in television, and I'm always amazed at 
hearing what something is, hey, Draymond Green punched his teammate, seeing it ends up escalating it to something incredibly different. But sometimes it takes that video to really make something stand out and happen and become more of a reality. Like when somebody tells you, hey, I got punched, like this is what it looks like. I mean, that was, an, I mean, impressive by NBA standards because usually NBA fights don't end like that. <laughs> um, it, it was a nice overhand right, and some are calling it a sucker punch. I'd probably be inclined to believe them. Um, these things do happen from time to time. Uh, they're hard to just flush and get rid of it and go back to normal. And I think there's, I think this could be one that uh, isn't necessarily one that, that they can put behind them. It's the latest in a long line of incidents with Draymond Green. And um, look, Jordan, Jordan Poole is going to get paid regardless, like whether he's with the Warriors, not with the Warriors. Likely, I mean, I can't imagine a scenario where he's not with the Warriors. Uh, it might be a draw line in the in the sand moment. I don't think that this is something that they can just put behind them and, and move on from. Uh, as much as they might believe they can, maybe they're going to attempt to, but I think ultimately there's going to be a decision they have to make, and I think it's going to be one or the other. Yeah, I think part of why it's so interesting is this nine, ten-year difference between the guys, you know, and the Warriors have a lot of other young talent on their roster where the idea of that they wanted to go younger and focus on that, that, you know, both Poole and, and Draymond being extension eligible, I think adds a um, little bit more of a complication to this but like when it comes to the actual altercation itself I, I mean both seem like guys that um, don't exactly keep their mouth shut when they're playing basketball and I don't think it's weird for there to be those sort of heated interactions um, and even the push like I, I fight back a little bit on sucker punch just because pool pushed them first but Draymond undeniably um, escalated the situation to an entirely another level and like you're saying, to see the punch is very different than just read the word punch because Poole kind of fell to the floor right after. It was it was a pretty drastic punch um, and a lot more than what I ex had expected. And I've been interested in all the conversations surrounding like the value of Draymond and because it seems like this is part of maybe not to this extent all the time, but it seems like this is part of what you're getting with Draymond's personality that we've known about for a long time. And at what point does his on-court production sort of start to outweigh this and it becomes just completely unacceptable and things that you're okay with, you don't have to live with anymore? Yeah, it's interesting. There is always that fine line, right? A guy is, like, you'll put up with a lot of stuff, but it's because the player is great. And you sort of have that, that tipping point, like, is he is he still worth it? And I think that that's something that the Warriors are going to have to ask themselves, like is dealing with this problem. Um, although, like, he does go through long stretches where he's fine. I just think that at the end of the day, like, you can't have one teammate punching another. Not like that. I mean, to me, that, like, that could have cost them six to eight weeks with a broken jaw. That could have cost them concussion protocol. Like, I mean, he was crushed. And I, it's surprising and, I mean, I, I do, you know, watching the film, it did look like uh, Jordan Poole, like, shoved Draymond Green pretty hard beforehand. But, like, we don't see those punches actually land very often at the NBA level. And, I mean, behind the scenes, like, there have been plenty of times where, like, punches have been thrown. Even in Sacramento. I mean, during the, the Cousins era. Everywhere. Every team. Uh, before the Cousins era, uh, like, they're, they're, these things happen. I mean, I, like, I remember locker room fights in, in high school, uh, multiple locker room fights. I was involved in a locker room fight. Like, these things happen, especially when you're playing sports and you're, you know, you're amped up and you're coming off of practice or whatever. And, um, you know, but, uh, like, what do you think should happen? What do you think will happen? Um, because we can kind of compare the Bobby Portis, uh, Miritich thing. Um, but even Bobby Portis, Portis was quick to point out on social media, like, hey, man, I was defending myself in that situation. And Bobby Portis got eight games from the Bulls when he clocked Miritich and, I, you know, did some damage. Um, but what do you think will happen? Or, and what do you think should happen? I'm curious. There should be, there should be a suspension, I think, for sure. But I think there should, that should have happened beforehand. Um, it could be it could happen in the preseason. I think they'd be fine for it. I don't think it necessarily has to trickle into the regular season. 
but I don't want to see the actions of the team be uh, changed now that the video is out there. And I, I, I took a lot of exception to, I mean, <laughs> shocker, you take exception to what you see on social media, but even uh, what you see trickle around. And I was in a discussion with it with some people at practice today and for anyone who's taking the, oh, this video leaked and that's like they're taking the focus away from the action itself, like shame on you. Like like shame on you. The leaking of the video is as a result of probably the way it was handled to begin with. Someone not liking the result, not someone not liking the way it was handled and thinking that you can keep a, a, a lid on it. Um, like, no. Like, I mean, I, I think it took it, – it, that's why you have this leak. And, if you, yeah, certainly you can try and bottle up the leak that's in your organization and, and what are you going to fire your video department, you know, I don't don't narrow it just to the video department could be the video company could be uh people in the front office could be a member of the coaching staff could be Jordan Poole himself could be Draymond Green himself could be a t- another teammate everyone has access to this video within the team so um to to, to try and narrow focus it to a video department le- leak that's that's just bullshit I mean that's terrible so and then to make it turn out like that's more vilified than the actual action itself from Draymond Green is what I really have a problem with so um look I don't want to make this into something bigger than it is. I mean, I'm not sitting here saying that Draymond Green should be suspended 20 games or 25 games. I think, again, the video's out there, but if someone says that if the report is accurate and we don't have video, to me it should be handled with the same amount of respect as if the video's out there uh, by the organization. So um, I- I'm curious to see what they're going to do. I know what I would do. I think it would probably be a game or two, and it would be something where – uh, it's a hefty, hefty fine from the organization. Um, I'd probably have to make a decision because, again, this is the the latest in a long incident, a long line of incidents that have happened with Draymond Green. Uh, I'm, you know, from from what I know, it's not the first time he's gotten into a fight with a teammate. Uh, I'll just leave it at that. And uh, I I really think they're going to have to make a decision with this guy. Yeah, to Brennan. me. A lot of it depends on how Jordan Poole feels about this. I, I can't imagine that he's feeling great or that it was warranted. Um, but, you know, maybe he does feel like he ran his mouth too far and sort of understands Draymond's side. Like a lot of it in my mind, um, just the repercussion should be a result of like conversations with both of those guys and, and seeing where they're at at this point and just a decision that should be made by Golden State themselves and i think that a suspension definitely makes sense but i'd be curious to if if i'm the organization kind of see where pool is at and what he feels like is is warranted and and just get his two cents not you know totally go with whatever he thinks is best but i'm curious where his, his head is at after this altercation and how he would feel moving forward and when it comes to like the video being put out and that may be taking away from the main point of just the altercation itself. I think that it is very interesting to me that the fact like the video came out and I think that that can be highlighted as its own interesting thing and another wrinkle to this situation without taking away from the altercation. I've definitely seen instances, a lot of instances where maybe the highlight is becoming the fact that this video exists and got put out kind of to Sean's point. So it shouldn't take away from it. But to me, it is a really interesting wrinkle coming from an organization that in my mind is typically pretty professional and like that's one of the last orgs I would have expected something like that to leak out of. Yeah. Okay. So I'm going to take it a little different. Okay. First of all, I think the body Bobby Portis suspension length is, is probably like in line with what should happen here. Um, and, and I could even see a few games more than that. Um, and that's not because the Kings play the Golden State Warriors on the third game of the season and play them twice in the first nine games, and I think it's three times in the first 13. Um, but I do think that, like, look, there is a, like, code of standards that have to, like, you have to, like, purport yourself a specific way in order to be an NBA player. And you have to live up to the standards of that. And... There are plenty of things in the league that you can get suspended for or thrown out of the league for, um, but like these are union workers. I mean, it's called a players' union. It's because it's a union. They're unionized, and like you don't do that. Like if, like when I worked construction years ago, like I don't know if people know this, but if you get in a fist fight, 
above uh, the second floor, if you're on the third floor or above in a construction building, it's an automatic felony because because the risk of death is there because you have you know open walls and stuff and so like beating on somebody at your place of business is totally unacceptable i know it's sports but at the same time like there ha there has to be like a code of conduct there has to be professional standards there has to be a a common baseline that we all see and like I, you guys your point that you know when you see the video it's so jarring um and, you know, like we've seen a lot of these videos over the course of the last few years, uh, specifically with NFL players. It seems like the NFL players always get caught on video hitting people. A lot of times it's a domestic situation. And I think that that cranks up like the volume a lot because, of course, you should never like I, to me, there's there's never a place for domestic violence at all. But even this is violence in the workplace and, and somebody got crushed. I mean, they're lucky he was up and shooting shots right afterwards, but the fact is like you could have you could have broke his jaw, you could have given him a major concussion, you could have done damage to him. Um and I just, you know, again, it, this isn't his first time being put in this in like this area with the NBA. Um and I, I just don't know how many times you got left of stuff like this. This is like to me it's almost Ron Artest like range it's it, it's heading towards that range where like look how many times do you get to do this and i mean the league dropped a hammer for our test going into the stands but i, I just like I, it's almost like a defenseless person that's what it looked like from the video yeah i see that i mean it's it's a little uh, I, I i would i get what you're saying i would disagree a little bit on that just because obviously every situation is kind of different but I, I totally understand what you're saying. And I, I can also say that as much as, like I said, to me it shouldn't take the video to figure out and treat it with the respect with it that. deserves. Yeah. Um, but I also don't think it necessarily has to reach the Bobby Portis level. Uh, I feel like the organization, it, this isn't, I think each organization is different in the way they handle things. And I expect a, a, I expect a punishment that would fit the crime, uh, so to speak. But I also feel like, as, as Brendan pointed out, I think a lot of it hinges on Jordan Poole. Fortunately, he was okay. Not that that really even should matter because you factor in what a what a what a consequence might look like. But I also feel like too the Warriors know that they've had moments like this in the past. Um, maybe not to this degree because obviously there's no video on a lot of the other incidents. But um, sometimes they can be used as galvanizing moments and. While I say I think there's a decision that will likely have to be made at some point, um, I, I and maybe and it probably isn't right away. With respect to that, I do think that um, I do think that there is a world that exists where everything's hunky dory going forward, and and they've been able to use it as galvanizing, bring the team together, unity, and and show uh, resilience in the face of you know some pretty awful <laughs> situations. So, um, but. I would like to see the Warriors handle this the right way, and uh, I guess we'll have to wait and see. The Draymond being Draymond, I mean, at, at what point does that does that end? Ah. Yeah, I mean, it's it's the gift and the curse. Like the guy is, he's so yeah. special for what they do. They they all, you know, and I've covered, I've been around that team as you have, James, and you've seen the good and the bad for a long time with them, and. Um, even in private conversations, I mean, people love that guy. People speak so highly of him. It's 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 kind of I, – I would often get – when we had DeMarcus Cousins here, and you can have someone who's that polarizing figure and, and who you're willing to, to put up with the crazy because it leads to success. And I think in DeMarcus's case, you weren't a good team. So when you're not a good team and you have those moments um, – that that don't even escalate to the level of punching somebody but just anything any little moment that it ends up being disciplinary or a distraction or something like that um it, it's all how much the organization can tolerate based off the success that they've had uh are to that point like these warriors teams success and talent aside and i know there might be some people that disagree but Take the success and that all that aside. Some teams are more apt to be able to handle a situation like that in the right way, 
as opposed to a younger team who doesn't have that type of galvanizing force, who doesn't have that type of leadership that the Warriors have had over the past few years uh, during that DeMarcus era where an organization, a front office, a coaching staff, and even teammates can't maybe uh, stomach it the same way as a Warriors organization can. Yeah, it's interesting stuff. And I, I mean, Sean and I both covered DeMarcus for a long time. And like, not to totally compare him and Draymond. No. Um, I, I just think that, that you know, like there there are some similarities about some of the things that happen behind the scenes um, between the two players. Um, and, and it makes you wonder, like if DeMarcus had been drafted to a team that was good and had players around him and, and would have succeeded, would DeMarcus have had the last three years in the league where you know he's sitting there in great shape begging to get back in the league at this point and uh and still no one signed him and last year like you know league minimum and year before that you're talking about like making pennies on the dollar versus you know the the john wall uh 47 million dollars that just got paid out that was demarcus's contract that he would have been paid if he would have got that extension with the sacramento kings and it just it does make you kind of think back like it's it's a moment in time and like situational for one player versus another and how things work out it really does uh make you wonder it's interesting um okay by the way by the way i wonder i i picture somebody listening to this and go you know hey i've seen hard knocks i've seen the fights in camp um we hear about this all the time. You see a baseball brawl that happens on the field, or as I like to call them, brouhaha's. Like, again, I, I I feel like the average person will think that this isn't that big of a deal, um, and I understand that because I don't necessarily treat it as the the biggest deal either. But I think it just happens to become what what in lies with the Golden State Warriors as it pertains to Draymond Green because it's the latest, like I said, in, in a long line of incidents. So um, ordinarily I'd be the guy saying, like if that was Jordan Poole and say Clay Thompson, whatever. You know what I mean? Like yeah. it, 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 at that point you just, it, you know, it, those are just guys being guys, whatever. Like it, it's 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 different at that point. You still you still have a, a consequence to the action, don't get me wrong, but when it's like, okay, this is Draymond Green again. It's like every year it's Draymond Green doing something, and I'm a huge Draymond Green fan, and it's part of what makes him such an interesting figure as a leader on that team. And and you can talk about whether whether you know the team was better with or without him last year. I get it, but I, look, I, I I fully I fully uh, anticipate Draymond Green to own his actions and say the right things. Uh, in an entertaining way it doesn't take away my amusement of Draymond Green or how great of a basketball player I think he is so um, I just feel like there there comes an enough as enough uh, moment and maybe this is it for the Warriors yeah it's interesting go ahead is there is there anything you guys can draw back and like compare this to like I, I know Malik said today that he hadn't quite said anything like it seen anything to that extent Mike Brown was kind of not kind of non-committal on uh, any comments on this situation but is there any sort of like parallels you guys can draw well I'll say I don't like the comparisons to Kermit Washington and Rudy Tomjanovich because that yeah. was a that was something completely different that was a sucker punch that no one saw uh, as he was coming with a full head of steam Kermit Washington that is it almost killed Rudy Tomjanovich mm-hmm. and that's back in the 70s so um, no I mean look have I? I mean, you know, you've had moments between Kenny Thomas and Sharif Abdurrahim. You had moments between Dante Green and Demarcus Cousins. You had um, moments in football all the time where there's scuffles uh, and, and punches are thrown. You know, it's again, this isn't unique to just what just happened with the Warriors. But I again, the fact that it's on video and <laughs> he landed, man. I mean, that's that's the part where it's just it's on video and he landed. He landed that punch. Uh, I think East Lansing would be proud of that punch uh, from where Draymond's from to say that that was something that, uh, you know, maybe the, it being a sucker punch, not proud, but he certainly landed it. So, um, yeah, it's Dray- almost Draymond's like, that dude, man. It's almost like the uh, if Shaq would have landed the punch on Brad Miller, oh boy. Um, that would have just, I mean, who knows? I mean, Brad Miller could still not be awake. Um, that was, that was violent, uh, but it didn't land. So this one did and it's teammates. And, you know, I I think that that's one thing, like, have we had some of these situations behind the scenes in Sacramento? Sure. Like the, the rumors and the murmurs and 
what we know that we're not going to report because no one would go on the record and stuff like that. There are plenty of situations that have happened in Sacramento, you know, um, especially during the Cousins era, whether it was Cousins or it was others, um, but typically surrounding DeMarcus. But um, yeah, but I don't think it was anything like this where we heard it was like a violent shot, like a um, maybe, you know, two guys doing fake fights in the uh, that's a lot of NBA stuff is like the fake tough guy stuff that never actually like evolves into an actual punch being thrown. Um, hold me back but, stuff. Yeah. Yeah. That, yeah. <laughs> well, I'm going to get you hold me back. Yeah. Uh, somebody hold me. Yeah. Wait, wait, please. Somebody hold me. So it looks like I'm doing something. Um, yeah, there's a lot of that. Uh, so yeah, I, I don't know. I mean, like in the locker room with the Andy Ferrillo situation where clearly cousins wasn't going to throw a punch, but was angry. Um, but those, you know, again, I, I don't think anything like that where we can say, oh yeah, that looked very similar. We at least don't have footage of it. That's what we don't have. We don't have the footage, which is, I think something that, um, that changes this one a little bit. Um, that, that takes us to uh, practice today. Uh, Brennan and Sean and I all went to, uh, training camp i don't know even know if it's still called training camp at this point it was training camp at one yeah, point that's, that's, that's accurate i think training camp is officially only like five days or something hmm. so whatever we're in right now it's just like the never-ending barrage of training camp um but uh we were able to ask mike brown uh sean and i both were kind of asking him about this situation and he skated it pretty pretty good uh he, he was like you know dodgeball dip duck what dip duck dodge. dodge duck dip dive and dodge a movie reference that i knew there we go Go ahead brendan why did you look share with the that? class this so, is, this so is what great did you, what did you think with uh mike brown like first of all reference the movie though dodgeball there dodge, you go dodgeball. Okay. i got you there right. no, okay. yeah i think most king's games should be on the ocho <laughs> the ocho <laughs> <laughs> bold strategy cotton <laughs> yeah and it's hilarious watching that back just Real quick, seeing that that broadcaster is the main character from Ozark. Just his name is totally Jason different. Bateman, and you can put it's some Jason respect on his name. Bateman, I don't know man. actors' names. He was guys. Teen Wolf Two. Come on, man! <laughs> wow. wow, come on! I gotta learn these. Names. That actor. His better. sister is Justine J- uh, Bateman from Family Ties. Come on, oh, come on, Brendan. <laughs> eventually i'll learn actors names there's different steps first i'll learn different movies and we'll eventually get to the actors here oh that's priceless yeah, go I, ahead finish the, your the thought now from Ozark. <laughs> jesus christ <laughs> when, it, when it comes to coach brown today um i mean you guys were the ones asking the questions so tell me if there's anything that stood out to you guys but to james's point i, I thought he kind of just skated around it pretty well and said that that's something that they should deal with within their organization. And I don't know all the details um, and inner workings of it and, and sort of just left it at that. And we haven't dealt like, like we haven't dealt, we being him and the Kings organization haven't dealt like with anything like that during this camp or anything. So that's something that they're going to have to deal with. Yeah. He said, it's their problem. And, and uh, as someone who look, Draymond Green and Mike Brown are incredibly, incredibly close. So uh, I think, Mike Brown did the right thing. He didn't really have to touch on it. He'll do stuff privately behind the scenes and probably lob a phone call. He's already has to um, Draymond Green, I'm sure. And uh, they'll have a talk about it, you know. But that's a that's a guy that definitely um, Draymond Green was very very close to in Mike Brown. And let's not let's mistake. He was the associate head coach of the Warriors, so he knows Jordan Poole as well. So um, he's 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 going to try to ignore it as much as possible, and he'll have the. Uh, the interest of both players at, at heart if they want to have private conversations. But when he's doing media in Sacramento, he's he's got bigger fish to fry now. That's their problem, as he said, and he's only concerned about what's happening with the Kings. Yeah, today was a funny media session with Mike Brown. He started off talking about, like, old WWF. Um, like, uh, like, <laughs> like it, was, it was some interesting. He was uh, – Deuce Mason was wearing a um, – Oh, who was the shirt that he was wearing? I don't remember. Um, it's not the Undertaker. It's um... oh, it's Stone Cold Steve Austin, right? Oh yeah, that's there who it was. Sto- Sto- but Stone Cold Steve Austin when he was young. Um, anyway, so they started in having a conversation about like wrestling, 
and I thought it was it was Did you just call it wrestling? I did. It's wrestling. Yeah. Oh my gosh. Mike Brown pounding his belly. That was a good moment. Um yeah. Yeah, it's good stuff. He he um, liked he liked my reason for not liking wrestling anymore. <laughs> Which was Well, okay, look, I can handle the fact that this is this is all entertainment and it's not real, but like for me when wrestling the day wrestling died or wrestling as James calls it yep. is when my favorite when I learned that my favorite wrestler Razor Ramon is really Scott Hall and not Cuban and we're going to lie about that that didn't sit well with me I'm like I'm done I'm done <laughs> well one of my favorite things from that start with Mike was Mike talked That's about his moment was when he learned that somebody was keeping a razor and like tucked into the their lip or something and then they pull it out and sort of do these cuts and that's like when he realized it wasn't real and he said that's like the day that i found out and then stopped and said no i can't there's probably kids watching and i'm like did this guy really just censor himself from saying santa doesn't exist hey and what I are you talking about hilarious. brennan what <laughs> stop this. Brennan, what are you talking about i thought that was a, hilarious there's a rule in my home you want to ask that question the second that you don't believe he stops coming yeah that's, so, so clean that's, it up. that's the rules bro that's my, the, fault. my fault. <laughs> this is this is a kid friendly show, Brandon. <laughs> Earmuffs. I, I thought uh, that Mike Brown's like he shifted so quickly because okay, so we're at practice. They, I kind of feel like maybe we're in like a weird high school musical where the Kings keep doing stuff on the court to after they let the media in to like show us like oh do you see this is happening so today it was they brought out uh, mark one of this the nba security guys and um lucas and what and lucas one of their trainers and they sing happy birthday but the whole group and they made the young guys sing and um all the new people in the organization it, it appeared it's a lot of kumbaya moments here that we're seeing and whatever we see like I'm starting to like look around like are we on candid camera um and so Mike started talking about the joy that joy is one of the things that it's one of his basic I don't know he's got a bunch of like if he probably has the 10 commandments but then he also has like the 14 amendments and like he like he has some complex like things that he goes off of but now joy has now been added what did you guys think about like finding joy and being part of like embracing like being on the basketball court and enjoying yourself and um and that's kind of his response how he got away from the Warriors talk and back to Kings talk. Uh I don't know. I I I think you're looking a little too much into it. I think a lot of the things he's trying to do particularly at the end of camp is keep things light and fresh because it's not yeah. Like the stuff we're not seeing is a lot of uh, demonstration, teaching, detailed uh, running, running drills, all this stuff where it's like it it it, it would it, it can really test the mind a little bit, especially for a team. That's why I asked Demona Sabonis to kind of talk about a Mike Brown camp compared to other places he's been. Uh, I mean, he had Rick Carlisle, you know, like guys who have, who are similar but he talks about just how much they work and how much that the practices aren't um like today they didn't like today it, mike made a uh, coach mike made a really good point yesterday of saying today is going to be a uh, a hands-off day a lighter day it's not we're not going to beat each other up uh we'll save that for saturday and sunday with the preseason game um they were going to keep it light they were going to do non-contact they were going to do a lot of just drill work and that can get tedious. And, uh, you know, the, I, I can see the person listening to this podcast and go, no shit, that's your job. That's why you get paid so much money to do these things. And, and you need these. But it's like this team in particular, you're creating not culture, but really just really strong work habits. And these are things that Mike Brown is going to expect. And that's why I was talking so much about why I feel like he's the right coach at the right time for this team because of how old school and detail oriented he can be. So, um, <laughs> but not everyone just takes to it like a duck to water. That's for sure. Yeah. I mean, he's installing like a foundation. 
And, and I mean, that's part of being a new coach. And that's why, like, there's always someone installing a new foundation, which is why you shouldn't switch out coaches because switching out foundations, it usually takes a while. But go ahead, Brendan. Yeah, I mean, I think that culture is maybe maybe become too broad of a term, but I think in the way that it's used, um, that this is kind of what culture setting and culture building looks like. I, I think that creating a environment that has joy and trust is another word we've heard a lot. Um, and sort of in my mind, it almost seems like a healthy family environment is good, like because accountability mixes into that as well. And you feel like you're more able to hold uh, the guy next to you accountable when you know that there's um, good intentions there and you have a good pre-built relationship, then you're more comfortable to call them out and sort of get things straight quicker rather than it being drawn out and maybe something they keep to themselves. So like to me, a lot of it just feels like building a comfortable environment where everybody is feeling good about showing up every single day more often as much as maybe anyone can um, like to your guys's point everyone's going to be different and respond to these tactics differently but i think just the importance of being a team and all together and just going through all of this as a group is to me like that sort of little details is what this whole culture building looks like yeah i i enjoyed um like we're kind of we're to that point where like we start asking questions about like how much of the game plan have you put in how much of the of the defensive strategy the offensive strategy just what does it look like how does it feel um and like how are players taking to it and you know i think like today i asked sabonis about is it easier because you have a bunch of high basketball iq players that you're taking in a bunch of new like a whole bunch of new ideas and you're, you're trying to build that trust and that camaraderie, but also you're trying to build chemistry. Like you, you got to figure out how to play together. And it seems like that there's a lot going on, but although they're practicing a ton, it does feel also like they are sticking together. And we got to see Malik Monk as well today. And Monk, he just always has a smile on his face, always goofing around a little bit. He's kind of one of those culture pieces that I think at this stage of the game, like really, really helps. Like having a guy who can keep it light and can help the the group laugh a little bit and mess around a little bit when you're, again, going through tedious drills again and again and again. I, I think it's a good thing. And every time we get him, he he just like his smile is is like infectious and it kind of draws you in. Um He's got to play, so we, we have to see what, how he looks on the court. But, uh, like, all of these pieces melding together, I don't think we could have had two, like, more diametrically opposed players come and talk to us today in Sabonis and Monk just because one of them is so, like, sort of straight-laced and the other one is smiling and having a good time with it the whole time. It, it does feel like there's a pretty solid mix here. I, I really got a kick out of Sabonis recognizing something that I think we all know, but I think it would – you know, surprise a lot of people when he's talking about, you know, we all go through youth basketball, high school, college, whatever it is, all levels of basketball, and you can still get to the NBA and not know how to play basketball <laughs> and like not know the nuances of the finer points of the game. And I just, I think that's refreshing to hear because uh, it, it, you just see it day in, day out and the way the NBA looks, the bad teams just don't play as a unit. Don't, don't play. Not, you know, you, there's a collective thread or a common thread other than talent uh, that that all the good teams have, and it's a sharing of the basketball. It's a one, everyone on a string kind of mentality, and um, those things can be hard to implement with young players in particular, but particularly ones that don't have the the high basketball IQ. So uh, it it is fun. And to your point about Malik Monk, like I want to talk to him every single day. The dude is just <laughs> so funny. Uh, I love the fact that. Uh, if you follow him on social media and the stuff that he had with Anthony Davis and the comments that Anthony Davis made after the uh, uh, Lakers lost to the Kings on Monday, um, it was hilarious. They were there was some harsh uh, words with some profanity in there that we don't necessarily need to say, and and then there was a double down on uh, what Malik Monk put on social media. So I just I literally had to go, hey, y'all are good, right? Like like I'm I think I'm picking up that this is all in jest and in fun and and leading people along but it certainly made some headlines out there and about the, what Anthony Davis said and what how Malik 
Monk reacted to it, his former Laker teammates last year. And he's like, no, no, we're good. That's just how he misses me. That's how he says he misses me. So it was, <laughs> I, I got a kick out of it. I thought it was hilarious. He also said that they talk almost daily. Yeah. That, that they, they text back and forth or, or talk on the phone like every other day. Um, and, and that they're really close. Now, Brennan, was it you that asked um, Monk about, was it a split cut? What was yes. it? That, yeah, go ahead. Yeah, I asked. Um, I, I just noticed kind of in their free flowing offense that it seems like Mike is um, that Mike is implementing is just there's a lot of these split cuts going on, which for any listener is, for example, say it's Fox and Herter while um, both off ball and Sabonis has a ball on the elbow. And then on the other end, you have Fox on the perimeter. Herter comes up and sets a screen for Fox. And those two guys can just go in opposite directions pretty much. And it's up to themselves to figure out um, what they want to do in each moment. And oftentimes, like, you know, if Fox is driving, um, it just causes a miscommunication between the defense, potentially, if Herder comes out. And just those two guys, whatever two guys are involved, are kind of up to their own decisions on how they want to go about that. And I think that there's a lot of chemistry and getting to know other guys tendencies that go into that um and i asked malik about that like kind of what's the importance and things to make sure you want to hit on in those cuts and malik just highlighted the importance of cutting hard um that and this is something mike brown talked about yesterday as well that even when you don't have the ball um, when he highlighted paint touches that even just cutting without the ball is something that functions as a paint touch when you draw the defense in. And this is something that I'm really interested to see from De'Aaron. I think De'Aaron cutting really hard to the basket, even when he doesn't have the ball is something that could do a lot for their offense. But as a guy that plays a lot of minutes and, you know, I, I think we've seen him sometimes maybe not go hundred percent on, on possessions that that's where those little details of doing that every single possession could have a big impact on the team. And I think his whole leading by example, that's an area where he could really do that. Yeah. In my time that I worked with Doug on TV, this dro drove Doug crazy. Always like behind the scenes. It was, he felt like so many of the Kings players made cuts because their coach told them to make cuts, not because they understood the why. And he said that was always such a huge thing for him. And he would try to like have conversations with some players. And every once in a while, you just see him like throw his hands up. Like he has no idea why he's cutting and he's two seasons in and he still has no idea. And he also doesn't know the difference between like jogging into a cut and then hitting hard or hitting hard from the beginning. Why that, why hitting a, a cut hard quick open stuff up for the people behind you. And like, it was very, very infuriating. So I love to hear some of this stuff because I know that Doug is there behind the scenes. Like you understand why we're doing this. Right. And, and some of the players are like, yeah. And like, I don't think you do. So let's walk through it. And, and that's a good thing because it's the nuances of the game that really for like the last decade that this team just has lacked. The immediate, the immediate answer to that, you know why we're doing this, right? Yeah, is, okay, great. Explain it to me. Tell me. Because, yeah, tell me. Because so often guys just want to be agreeable and get rid of the conversation. It's like, no, you, you really have to hammer this in and understand. And you might know a fraction of what you're really trying to implement. And it's a good thing Doug doesn't have hair because I think he would have pulled it all out. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I, I, like we've seen it a long time, though, for a long time, where they just don't get it. They don't right. understand, like, the ins and the outs of it. And it's something that, you know, Pete Carrill imparted on Doug and other coaches imparted on Doug. But it's something that they have to do. Like, if you're going to get these guys open, and just by if, like, what Brennan's talking about, that split cut, if both of those guys split out quick, it frees Domas to go do something on his own. Like, it, it jars the play and allows for more movement and uh and so I, i'm excited to see like how much they can get of their offense in and how many of these sort of like read and react moves that they can actually develop in such a small like stretch of time because it, it really does come down to chemistry with players on the court it comes back a little bit to what Domas was talking about too, the things that you learn in early basketball. I, I think what stood out to me with that conversation is just like the highlighting of fundamentals. And I think that when you get to a 
high level of play, it's easy to kind of forget about all these tiny basic details and like that I'm a super athletic guy that I can go up and chase that rebound, but that doesn't mean that I shouldn't still feel the need to put a body on someone when a shot goes up and make sure to box out or when I'm setting screens, making sure that um, the ball handlers rubbing shoulders or that I'm, I'm making sure that I'm really making contact on that screen. I just think like when you reach a higher point and you start to focus on further levels of the game, it's easy to forget to make sure you're still doing all those very basic fundamentals. Right. And to me, that also just echoes what we've seen Mike Brown preaching a lot, all the details, um, all detail oriented and, um, it just all kind of fits into that. Yeah, I, I remember Willie Cauley Stein in his second uh, training camp. Like Willie, what's different this year? This year, a coach tells me to go run over there. I know why I'm running over there. Last year, I just ran over there and I had no idea. Like the whole year, yeah, pretty much. Like I had no idea why I was running over there, but I kept doing it because they kept telling me to do it. And like so, eventually, I just realized that I needed to run over there. And it's like, do you know why? Well, yeah, I think so now. It's like, oh no! I miss so, talking to Willie. I do too. I do too. <laughs> that yeah. dude, he told him he told on himself a lot, but like you could have great conversations with him. <laughs> he did tell on himself all the time. Yeah, all the time. Like I oh. really enjoyed talking to Willie. He's a good dude. I hope that yeah, he man. figures it out. He's he's I think in Philadelphia camp with Jaeger, I think. But they Boy. signed Montrez Harrell, so I don't know. They they have some young guys. I, I don't know. I'll I'll have to look that one up. Um, but yeah, there, there's these moments though, where that's what so many of these coaches, and it's why I brought up, uh, like, like maybe two weeks ago, like De'Aaron Fox walked on into his rookie season and we all know that it was, you know, Fox and Justin Jackson and Harry Giles, but also Frank Mason. And they brought over Bogdanovich from Europe that year. So you had five rookies. And then the year before they had drafted Papa Giannis and Malachi Richardson and Scalabi Sierra, but then also they traded for Buddy Hill in the middle of the season, who was also a rookie. So you get to Fox's first season, and Dave Yeager had nine players who were rookie or first year or, or had one year under their belt. And just think how difficult it is to teach when nobody knows anything, and you're starting at such a basic, basic, like you know what I'm saying? Like at right. the NBA level, they don't know anything. And just the teaching that goes into that and how much work that goes into it. And it's also why I'm really excited about the fact that this Kings team is all a bunch of second contract guys. Like the core of their team is either second contract or their older rookie first year players. You know, like Davion's 24. Davion's the same age as Fox, Monk, and Herter. And uh, Keegan Murray clearly, you know, is a very mature player at 22, um, but he's also an older, I mean, he's a sophomore, 22-year-old sophomore, basically, uh, coming into the league. So, I mean, these are players who are more refined, and then, you know, the veterans that you do have that might play, they are all sort of that same thing, you know, even when you're coming off the bench with Trey Lyles. Trey Lyles knows his stuff. It's not like you have to teach Trey Lyles a bunch of stuff. They They've prioritized intelligence basketball iq communication um, maturity they're, they're, yeah yeah i mean maturity sure because you still want to get guys that are you know especially if you can have a homegrown talent like you know like davion you're still young enough to where you can you can enjoy many years of them if if they blossom into the player that you think they could be um but clearly like this front office has an emphasis on intelligence and there's a lot of benefits to getting smart players around Domas. Like Domas really is going to reward guys that that cut in the right way and, and just take advantages of, I mean, just moving smart around the floor. I, I think that obviously the, the organization has dealt with guys that uh, maybe were on the opposite end of that. So I think that could have an influence of deciding, okay, we want to go get higher IQ uh, basketball IQ players. But I think there's also in my mind, an aspect of just having Domas on your team and how much of a benefit it is for having smart players playing off of a uh, big that distributes like that. Yeah. I think in with Domas, like he steps on the court and it's like when you're playing one of those games that you play online with a bunch of people 
And if you play with a really good player, like everyone's XP goes up like three. That's what it feels like with, with Domas. Like he steps on the court and he instantly makes everyone else smarter. They're all paying attention now because if you're not, he's going to hit you in the head with a ball. You know, he's, he's going to be active. He's going to throw the ball around. He's, he's waiting for smart players to make smart plays. And yeah, I do think that this team, you know, at, at a minimum, we're going to see that. Um, we get the Portland Trailblazers coming into town on Sunday. Uh, this is going to be one of those teams that the Kings are potentially fighting for that, like, I don't know, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11 spot in the Western Conference. Like, what do you guys expect out of this team coming in? And, like, how many – they've had a lot of change as well. And how do you think these two will mm. sort of mesh and, and, and go against each other? Like, is it a good matchup for the Kings? You're opening up against this team on the 19th when you open your season. So yeah. I don't think you want this to look like a dress rehearsal. I know some people would maybe like it to be. But as Mike Brown talked about, like, even today, I think there was some – uh, nuggets that we got in the fact that I think we we had all assumed and knew that Kevin Herter would be the starting two guard. That looks yeah. like that'll happen. Power forward still obviously up in the air. I don't uh, expect necessarily Casey Akpala to, to to start as he did on Monday in L.A. Um, so we could see a different starting uh, player although, there. Although, although all week won- long we've seen Casey Akpala working right. with the starters all Correct. week long. Go Correct. ahead. And, and I also think too that. Uh, even if he does, you know, like even if he does, it's still a feeling out process. And what Mike Brown said today, which was, uh, although earlier in the week he said he's not going to go play all twenty guys, he'll play more of like maybe fifteen. Won't go nearly as deep, um, but he's expecting to have roster cuts made uh, after the second game, the first round of cuts. Um, we'll see the the roster be trimmed up I a he bit. Said he so he wanted to see one or two more games. Yeah, it's, I'm saying after this one, at, at least after the the Sunday game. Like it, okay. it could be one, it could be two, but it's definitely going to be after this Sunday. So um, it, it's it's a matter of, in my mind, to getting. I feel like I think these cuts could come relatively soon because I think you want to have as much uh, practice, rotational, all these things done, uh, and make most of the days that you have in front of you without a bunch of guys still in camp that may may not be here so uh maybe cut it off at the at the at, you know cut it off immediately and then kind of make the most of the of the of the of, of the remaining week or whatever of practice time that you can get with another game or two remaining on your schedule and i don't know that you'll fully see the 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 dress rehearsal in the starting lineup and see that trickle over you might see it in different spots within the game uh at some of those rotations but uh I'm, I'm looking forward to it, especially – I'm actually really excited to see what the stands look like. I want to see what the support is uh, surrounding this team and the excitement level. Yeah, selfishly, when it comes to who we see play next game, I want to see the guys that I feel like are up for debate in my mind in the rotation. Like, I, I would love to see more Moneki to get a little bit of a better idea of what he could potentially bring. But obviously the organization and coaching staff have had a lot more of an opportunity to get a look at Moneki and these other guys um, than I have. So I think it's just a little bit more of a selfish thing that I'd like to see him in this system a little bit more. But if they were to decide to cut anybody at this point, I I think Sean's point makes a lot of sense. Um, We are officially at the point where I'm probably putting too much stock into all these groupings that we see at practice, because I feel like it's a trend at this point. And, you know, we've seen that like today they were doing uh, this three point shooting drill all in groups of five. Um, Well, I guess it was groups of one had a group of four because it looked like Rashawn Holmes still wasn't there. Wasn't at yesterday's practice because of a, uh, like a stomach bug or something like that, right? So nothing too serious, but I didn't see Holmes out there today either. Um, I don't know if you guys did, but I did not. But the groupings... I looked, I looked yeah. back at the film and I didn't see him. Um, but the groupings we've seen are, are Fox Herder, HB, and KZ with Sabonis in that first group. Um, the second one that we've seen is Mitchell, Monk, Murray, Lyles, and then usually Holmes would be there, but it was Len today. Uh, the third grouping is Delhi, TD, Sam Merrill, uh, Chemezi Metu, and then typically Alex Len would be there, but they had someone from their training staff fill in that spot today. And then the fourth grouping is Quinn Cook, Keon Ellis, 
Kent Bazemore, Chima Moneki, and, and Nami Ishikata. So just saying, I'm officially at a point where I'm probably overreacting to these because it feels like a trend. Well, and to that point too, these these jerseys are reversible. Um, some of them, you know, again, you just you throw them on, you can switch them out. I think it's it's by the time, yeah, the media's let in. This is what you're looking at. Um, I don't think they're trying to use smoke and mirrors by any means, like trying to pull a wool over anyone's eyes. But I think those are the groupings that they like based off of positions. Um, if you look at a depth chart, you might have certain guys a little higher than others. But like, yeah, like Sam Merrill being ahead of like your two way players, probably not. So it's just strictly positional yeah, it's i think interesting. the the merrill stuff to me real quick like you know i don't think that i'm not taking O'Merrill being in that third unit means he's for sure over Bazemore or moneki right. like i think there could be an aspect of maybe you need sam merrill in that group because if you put a moneki or a Bazemore, all of a sudden there's no shooting in that lineup that's functioning together just when it comes to these practice yeah. drills and you just need a shooter in there just for the functionality of that lineup so i think there's definitely different things that factor in but just seeing these same pairings a lot, I feel and, like. And a lot of the five on, five off is typically what will happen in different scrimmages. So you'll have, you know, maybe you go one through you first to five here. Great, winning team now plays this. This Here comes on the next five, almost like these hockey substitutions. Line yeah. changes. Yeah. Yeah, um, I think it is interesting that we're kind of seeing the groups staying together for, like, the whole week. Um, again, I don't know what that means. I, I think basically we do know, like, there is kind of a set ten. And then we know that Alex Len is like the third string center in case something happens. And then there's probably like two or three guys in that, that third unit that are still in some sort of conversation for playing time. And it's just going to be situational. And that would be, you know, guys like Chemezi Metu, Terrence Davis, um, maybe Moneki. But I'll also point out that I think that there's a good chance that, you know, if, if Casey Akpala isn't in the starting lineup, he could not be in the rotation, that it could be someone else. And that if, you know, again, a, they really like what's happening in the second unit with Keegan Murray, it's possible that Keegan Murray doesn't move up into the starting lineup, that it's someone on the back end uh, that's in that, you know, 11 through 15 range that moves into the starting lineup while Casey Akpala moves back. Um, I, I just think that there's a lot of things that could happen um, as they kind of figure out like what works best together, if that makes yeah. sense. Yeah, and Mike Brown said today when it comes to the four, like tonight we might need this, tomorrow we ne might need that. Um, we heard him say Keegan can play two to four in a way that he thinks, but it's just all matchup specific, right? And I think we heard Keegan say the same thing when he got asked about his position. It just depends who's on the other side of the floor. And that's where I'm a little bit curious with like Portland. I think these are two opposite sides where when you're talking about the Lakers, you're talking about LeBron, AD, and D, and D Jones. When you're talking about Portland, then your, your three in the front court are Josh Hart, um, Jeremy Grant, and Josef Nurkic. So is this a, a time where maybe you don't need the same length and defense that Casey brings, and then maybe you can look towards Keegan? So to, I think it's been interesting if we've heard a lot about it depends what's on the other side of the floor. Yeah, it should be intriguing. Um, all right, uh, we're going to close this down early tonight. Uh, Sean has to get to high school football. Uh, we probably should have done a live show, but it's like timing fault. these things, coming back, it's not all that easy to figure out. Um, we did the business business of basketball is more of the, um, the stuff at the beginning of the show with Draymond Green. Um, but uh, Brennan, do you have any final thoughts? What do you got for us? Um, I don't know if I... I don't know if I do. I'm hoping that we see Fox and Sabonis staggered a little bit more. Um, I hope that's something we see throughout the course of this year. What do you mean? You want to see him drunk well. or something? No, staggered in oh, the lineups. I see what you say. Come on, Sean. Um, I'm not like staggering around like Sean and I will be later. No. Oh, definitely. <laughs> no, but that's just me trying to find something for a final thought. I don't know that I have much. My Sean. final thought would be I uh, had a cool moment with uh, De'Aaron today. He wrote in on a uh, SAC Metro, this cancer engine. Sounds terrible. But it's a fire truck painted blue and pink for breast cancer and prostate cancer awareness uh, with SAC Metro. And it's like Kaiser and I'll be aware, uh, which does a lot of like his mother, who's a 20-year breast cancer survivor. She just mm -hmm. hit her anniversary. And he, he surprised some cancer survivors uh, through I'll be aware with uh, – tickets to an upcoming game and they were 
very happy. <laughs> like I just put it that like as you as you can imagine, but like to see someone like that smile as my buddy Eric Rucker just walked in. Um, he's an avid listener to this show. There he is. Look at that handsome <laughs> bubble. That's <laughs> not awkward. <laughs> um, but no, to see to see like cancer survivors smile, like I, it's very personal to Darren. Obviously, with his what his mother's gone through, uh, that was it's just really cool, man. I love that stuff. So yeah, we'll be seeing them, uh, I believe, Friday. But yeah, he got to ride in on the fire truck. I was a little jealous of that because that fire truck looked awesome. Mm, that's incredible. Yeah, uh, Darren's mom early, like very young. When she yeah. caught breast cancer, and I believe her sister uh, also caught breast cancer very young and did not make it, um, and uh, so it, it's something that's in there uh, that that weighs heavily on their family, and that's what's the Fox Family First mm-hmm. organization. So yeah, Darren De- does some good stuff uh, off the court with, when it comes to breast cancer awareness, just because I mean he lived through it, he lived through it with his mom. Um, okay, I'm going to mention, uh, I mentioned this on... No downers. No, don't lead us no, on no, a downer. No, on D-Lo and Casey. I, I okay. think I listened to this. Hey, um, the uh, King's Film Room uh, Twitter account, um, I thought that they did a really interesting job of breaking down some of what we saw from Mike Brown's, um, from his stu- from his first game, and sort of how you could see the offense grow. Uh, so broke down possession by possession on the offensive end. Um, so if you guys have a chance, like, look, there's a bunch of people out here that are doing really good work right now. I know, like, Will Z uh, is, like, the stats guy that's popping up stuff all the time. Um, there, there's a, a lot of people that are out there doing good work. So um, give it a look just because it's intriguing to kind of see it for yourself broken down into small, like, digestible pieces. And so you could start to get a feel for what a Mike Brown offense would look like. I want to see more pick and rolls. Um I know that's something they want to go away from, um, but like that stuff is some tested, time tested, like valuable stuff that I like to see on the court, especially with Sabonis and Fox. Uh, I do like the read and react. I do like a lot of what their their free flowing motion offense and stuff. Um, but yeah, this thing hopefully will get put together pretty quickly. Um, we'll be back uh, next week. Um, we're gonna try to do one live show late. Um, we'll also try to do a happy hour next week. Um, I've got to figure that one out still. Um, but it's about timing and dates and all that stuff and, and guests and their availability. Um, outside of that, thanks for tuning in to the Kings beat, uh, podcast. Uh, make sure to give us a thumbs up, make sure to give us a subscription. If you're listening on iTunes or wherever you're listening, uh, give us a rating and review that always helps us. Uh, and if you like the content that we create here at the King's Beat, jump on board with a premium subscription to the King's Beat, uh, kingsbeat.com, and uh, it's 7 bucks for a month or 75 bucks for a year. It's a good deal. You get access to all the content that we create, uh, and uh, we'll be here all season long. So for Fox 40s, Sean Cunningham and Brendan Nunes from the King's Pulse Podcast. I am James Hamm, King's Insider for ESPN 1320 and the King's Beat. See you next week.